On to something that's uh, just as cool, but <laughs> somewhat closer to home. Uh, we're on to our Cyborgs posts now, and we had a guest post this week from um, Anthony Hall, who's an associate professor at Monash University in, in Australia, and he blogs about the race to create the bionic eye. So Amy and I have mentioned a few implants here and there Ooh. and a few ways of interfacing with technology, but this is talking about a full-on bionic eye for those people with serious blindness. So as a wee bit of background, he goes through it in a lot more detail. It's a really, really interesting post. And he uh, offers a few interesting predictions on how soon we'll see some of these bionic eyes on the market. He notes that one of them already is, and there's about three or four others that are in the pipeline and expected to hit shelves or whatever it is that bionic eyes sit on um, within the next couple of years. But to give some background... Um, general structure of the eye is you have your you have your pupil you have the big kind of squishy circular bit uh, you have your retina at the back so light comes in through your pupil it's focused by a lens in the middle of your eye it's focused onto the retina the retina is full of these nerve cells called rods and cones that pick up the light and then uh, your optic nerve transfers uh, that light as an electrical signal to your brain. Now that's a hugely, hugely oversimplified version. <laughs> like everything to do with vision, it's very, very complex. But the important part there is that you can see about three or four different places where vision can go wrong. Mm -hmm. So you could have a disruption in the optic nerve, you could have something blocking the lens or a clouding of the lens so that light doesn't get focused onto the retina. You could have something um, go wrong with the nerve, uh, so the rod and cone cells on the netna, retina. And all bionic eyes which seek to treat any of these particular conditions need to approach it in a slightly different way. And then there's some where the optic nerve doesn't connect to the right point on, on the actual brain. And so at the moment, there's three different types of bionic eye under development. Um, one of them is essentially a webcam. <laughs> and it's a webcam that interfaces directly with your brain. So you have a little light sensor, you have a small computer that processes the data from that light sensor, and it turns it into a format that your brain can actually perceive. And the current science there is getting this to interface with your brain, because the optical area of your brain is spread over a very, very large surface area. And it's problematic to get a webcam to interact with the same kind of area. The second method is to put in a, uh, a fake retina behind your existing retina. So this requires some serious surgery. Uh, but the idea here is that if your eye is functioning correctly and your optic nerve is functioning correctly, rather than cutting everything out, you could just replace the retina with something that's functional and then get that to interface with the optic nerve. The third method is putting in a retina in front of the existing retina. So this is implanting it directly into your eye itself and getting that to interface either with your optic nerve or directly with your brain. Very, very exceedingly cool stuff. And uh, in the next few years, we will see treatments for these, uh, for various different blindnesses by actual physical implants of bionic eyes. So we've already got uh, bionic ears, so we've got cochlear implants which are, are stock standard in, in many countries now, which is um, very, very cool, but it's vision is a lot more complicated, so it's understandable that it's taking some time, but it's really exciting to see that we're so close together. And this is not even mentioning the improvements to human biology that you could make with a bionic eye. <laughs> yeah, the augmented stuff as well. Yeah. But, but, but how exciting that, that we can get it working, you know, at all, because a, a loss of vision for most people is just utterly devastating. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, well thanks for that. Um, and, then, and then we're going to move on to something uh, uh, um, a little more lighthearted, but just as fantastic. Over on uh, Forensic Scientist, which is penned by Anna Sandiford, she has a wonderful blog post on um, what the Foo Fighters and Geonet have in common, and it wraps up. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to I have to say this. It's because they rock, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, like a tree. I, I hope everyone is groaning at that. I, I hope so. We may just lose <laughs> half of our, you know, three audience members on this one. Thanks, Alf. Um, <laughs> yes, apparently uh, Geonet, which is run by GNS, of course, is, as well, certainly as many New Zealanders would know. Um, and for people who are not familiar with Geonet, go and check out the website. Just Google Geonet. It's quite fantastic. Um, but the seismic detection system that Geonet runs picked up vibrations from the Foo Fighters concert at Western Springs in Auckland on December 13th. <laughs> like, 
quite a lot, actually. Awesome. And and Anna was saying that she was at the concert, and, and she's not surprised because it is sort of one of the great stadium rock bands. They're known for putting on, you know, a damn good time for people. And you can see, and she's got in her blog post, um, there's the seismogram, and you can see that you're almost able to detect individual songs. Um, but she reckons that the vibrations were probably more from uh, uh, fans dancing and less from the sound system itself. So people jumping up and down, pinged geonets, um, sensors, which isn't, I mean, they are very, very, very sensitive sensors. So, uh, yeah, and then, and, and then she talks about, um, you know, the different types of songs. So quieter songs uh, don't, you know, get the crowd really going. But, of course, some, sounds, some songs are, are very much sort of dance heavy. And when the Foo Fighters came on stage, apparently everything went up from about 820. And you can see that again in these uh, vibrations. So I, just marvelous. Um, she also goes on to talk about her uh, anecdotal sort of medical, mm. or, or, well, sorry, the physiological <laughs> concerts. She says it's entirely non-medical and it's purely anecdotal, but talks about um, how she likes to think about concerts in terms of feeling her bones shaking, um, feeling her subcutaneous fat and her skin shaking, feeling her ears ringing, all of that. Uh, and, and she's of the opinion that this, this concert was much less physically damaging than many she's been to uh, over the years, which she finds surprising, especially considering that she's a bit older than she used to be. But I've seen uh, Anna, you know, she's hardly ancient. <laughs> <laughs> like really, really not. So, uh, so, so good stuff there. Um, oh, she she did also say that it would be very interesting to uh, set up some experiments, particularly around physiological effects, uh, for people attending, say, Michael Bublé and Metallica. Um, she has said she'd be more than keen to do the Metallica or possibly another Foo Fighters gig, but would like somebody else to do the Michael Bublé. So, if anybody's interested in the, the great crooner's work, I actually think it's quite pretty sometimes. But um, yeah, there's probably a lot of stamping. Yeah, I don't know, but the, the, I hear that the mosh pits at Michael Bublé concerts are just insane. Dude, you know, people get a couple of you know, white wine spritzes into the, uh, chaos. It's complete chaos. <laughs> it's pandemonium. <laughs> and I, I just got to uh, point out my favourite part from this post. Uh, while I am a fan of the Foo Fighters and a fan of uh, anecdotal evidence, um, <laughs> the cool thing here is that Anna actually describes it all in a very, very personal way and it's yeah. lovely to be able to see the real human being behind the science mm. uh, that scientists it's a side of scientists that we don't really get and when you know when I tell non-scientists that I you know go to Foo Fighters concerts and do normal things they look at me like I'm completely insane they do kind of forget sometimes that scientists are humans we are <laughs> I promise we just have strange interests as well as being human maybe we don't want to be anyway moving along um, <laughs> so uh, also check out there are a couple written around the PM Science Prizes, as um, Elf mentioned. Alison Campbell writes about the uh, Teacher's Prize. Also, uh, Gareth Renodon, who writes Hot Topic, writes about the uh, geoengineering research that was won by the uh, New Slash University of Otago team. Um, so do go and have a look at those. Uh, oh, and also, um, Marcus Wilson has written a post recently about the Higgs boson, um, what I'm so not going to call the God Particle because it really irritates me as a name for something. Um, and he will be writing another one in January. Uh, some of our listeners may have heard this last week. There was a huge amount of excitement about the fact that we've totally not necessarily found the Higgs boson, but we've found <laughs> which, which was a classic sort of media blowout over scientists going, look, we've got an interesting result here. Um, we, we have an interesting result here. Uh, we, we, we're going to keep looking at it. Uh, we think we know exactly where it's not. <laughs> well, that's, that's the other thing, which is actually really useful as well. But, but what a lot of people forget is that they were looking in the energy ranges at which it was least likely to be anyway. So, you know, it's the classic thing of, of eating all the stuff on your plate that you don't like so you can save the best for last kind yep. of thing. Um, and so it makes sense now that as they've gone further and further along, you know, people have been freaking out and going, oh, there's not this many more places for the boson to be hiding. And you're like, no, but... Um, what we've not yet looked at are the places that it was always the most likely to be anyway. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, maybe Higgs, maybe not. We, we don't really know. But there are some great posts as well that we'll link to about that, just sort of explaining in more detail why there is some excitement, but, but why uh, a level of caution is needed and sort of how the um, confidence is calculated around results and, you know, the, the, the 125 GV bump, et cetera, et cetera. They're really interesting. Yeah, they're, they're 
really fantastic. So uh, essentially, um, to go into slightly more detail, because for once we actually have a little more time, the cool thing is that they've done experiments where statistically it's very, very unlikely for the Higgs to... There's no evidence of the Higgs outside of this region between, I think it's 120 and 150 uh, giga electron volts. Yeah. And this means that it's within six sigma, which uh, it, you know, we're very, 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 very certain of these results. Mm. And so the only place that it could possibly be, if it does exist, is within this region. Oh. And um, the preliminary results are that there is a bump in this region, but it's not anywhere near as statistically definite as studies in any of the other regions. Yeah. And that's some of the stuff that Marcus goes into in his post. Yeah, exactly. You have to think about sort of people say that they're 94 or 98% confident, but of course in physics that isn't nearly enough. You're looking at 99.999% kind of before you can start being a little bit sure about your results or, or really celebrating them. Especially with particle physics. Especially with particle physics, exactly. Um, yeah, great, great explanation of their thing. So, so do go and read up on that because that is, it's just fantastic stuff as well. Um, right, so I think that's all we have left but for events. Elf, I believe there are some cool events this week. Uh, there is one big one on my calendar, <laughs> and once again, it's a shameless self-promotion. On Wednesday evening down in Wellington, up at the Carter Observatory, is a celebration of the summer solstice. And so a bunch of the Carter presenters and myself <laughs> are actually presenting stories based around the sun and the solstice celebration on uh, Wednesday evening. So you can book that by giving Carter a call, or you can find more information on the Carter website. Yes. Amy, cool. are there any events on your calendar well, for the week? Well, there's actually something on Tuesday as well, 70th Anniversary Carter Observatory Searching for Stars. Um, oh, yes, there is as well. Yes, so apparently uh, the Carter Observatory is looking for uh, the boys who first started going there, I believe, like when they were boys, and, and to find out if 70 years later or 60 or 50 they're still going there. So this looks like a beautiful piece of history as well. Um, and that'll be fun to, to keep watch of. Of course, everything is winding down somewhat for, for the holidays. Um, yes, <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> um, it's, it's, been a, winding down. it's been a long and tiring year. Um, but, but no doubt there'll be lots and lots and lots of uh, wonderful sort of Christmas events. We won't be speaking to people before Christmas happens. So uh, I'd like to say certainly on behalf of me and I'm sure from Elf, do have a Merry Christmas and do drive safely <laughs> if you're on the roads. Yes. <laughs> but have a wonderful time with, with fam family and friends and loved ones and get some sleep, man. Yeah, but stay, stay curious, yeah. right? Do science experiments on them if you can. Um. <laughs> experiments around overeating and overdrinking. <laughs> and oversleeping. Um, oversleeping is good during this period. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, have a wonderful time. We'd like to say uh, thank you to State Shirt and Rian Sheehan for our music. Uh, Elf, who else do we say thank you to? To Cyblogs and the Cybloggers for providing us with stories, discussion topics, and uh, generally making our lives more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, remember, you can subscribe to the official Cyblogs podcast via iTunes. You can follow us or listen via YouTube at youtube.com slash user slash Cyblogs podcast. Or you can follow our RSS feed at cyblogs.co.nz slash TOSP. Or you can watch us on Zilm, the cool science channel, and you can find us and other quality science podcast at sciencepodcasters.org. Yeah. If you have any comments and suggestions or Christmas wishes, please uh, put something on the TOSP blog. And if you like us, um, try and write a review and rate the podcast on iTunes because it helps keep us on the front page, put us on the front page. Um, or just share a link to this week's podcast via any of your social networking sites. You can follow Cyblogs and the other posts by subscribing to emails, or Twitter or RSS. You can do all of that by visiting the Cyblogs homepage at cyblogs.co.nz and you can help support the site by getting Cyblogs apparel which is seriously cool. Uh, it makes great Christmas presents from uh, www.zazzle.com slash A-I-M-E-E-M-W You can follow Amy and myself via Twitter or you can just follow us via our respective Cyblogs. Otherwise, from Amy and myself and Merry Christmas and stay curious. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.